Welcome to today's video where we're going to talk about what makes a good language model. I'm going to assume for the purpose of this video that you know what a language model is. If not, check out a conceptual introduction to the Shannon game and how to estimate simple language models from the links in the description. If you're familiar with machine learning, you're probably familiar with using accuracy to see how good a model is. You'll know that we often use accuracy to measure whether a prediction is right or not. So why doesn't that work for a language model? So if we use accuracy, let's say that we have a test sequence A, B, C, D, E, F, and we ask a language model to play the Shannon game and guess the next word. So, uh, so here it makes a mistake and it keeps going and it makes another mistake uh, here at the end. So the accuracy is five over seven. It only made two mistakes. So why doesn't this work? Consider the sentence, I came home from a long day of work and sat on my... There are some good predictions and there are some bad predictions. Good guesses are things like sofa, butt, couch, recliner. Not so great guesses are things like excavator, workstation, spaceship, or jump seat. These are things you can sit on, but they don't really fit in this context. It also shows you how hard language modeling actually is. Totally wrong guesses would be things like eggplant, hammer, asphalt, or meteor. The key idea is that we want to compare distributions. We have a true distribution that we want to model, and then a model that outputs some other distribution, and we want to know how different these two distributions over words actually are. And you probably have an idea of where this is going from the experiments that Shannon did, asking to guess the next letter. But we'll do this with words instead. If you ask for a guess how many guesses it takes to get the right answer, it's a measurement of the underlying entropy of English, say. And that's exactly what we're doing here. While it's safe to assume that Claude Shannon's wife was pretty smart, our language models are dumb. But we're going to use similar ideas to measure how good the guesses are, but we're going to compare it to the underlying distribution. To get there, let's briefly review entropy. Recall that the entropy is normally represented with the capital letter H, and we're going to take the negative sum over x, where the little x represents a single outcome, for example, a word, px is the true probability, of an outcome, and then we have the base 2 log of the same probability. Conceptually, this is the number of bits you need to represent a distribution. You can think about it as the following. The negative log of p of x is how many bits you need to represent a single outcome. The lower the probability, the more complicated the representation you need. So we'll now turn normal entropy into cross entropy. Cross entropy looks a lot like entropy, but what's different is that we're going to replace the log of p of x with log q of x. And to go back to the information theory justification of entropy, instead of using p of x to guide how we encode the distribution, we'll use q of x. So you want to use a small number of bits to encode the really frequent stuff, but if q of x is really different from p of x, then you'll use the wrong number of bits and pay a big price for that compared to the original distribution. Cross entropy measures just how much of a mismatch this is, so the bigger the mismatch, the higher the cross entropy. But this isn't exactly fair. Cross entropy is strictly lower bounded by the normal entropy. So the more complicated the underlying distribution is, the higher the cross entropy is going to be as well. So to correct that, we're going to use the Kolbach Lieberg divergence, KL divergence for short. This is just the cross entropy minus the entropy of the original distribution. So we write this as an operator on two distributions with a double line between them. Then you subtract the entropy from the cross entropy. When you write out the full math, you can factor out the probability of an observation and then simplify the log 
to become a ratio. When you write it this way, you can see the nice property that when the distributions are actually the same, the log becomes log of 1, and log of 1, regardless of the base, is always 0. So then the Kale divergence between two identical distributions is also 0. But hopefully you can also see that this is not symmetric. The Kale divergence between P and Q is different than between Q and P. When we talk about variational inference later, we'll talk more about how this is a nice property. But for now, it's enough to know that this is how you can compare two different distributions. Before we move on, one bit of math that sometimes confuses people is where the heck did the minus sign go to? Both of these entropies have a minus sign, but we're subtracting out the normal entropy, so the two minuses cancel out, and then the cross entropy keeps the minus sign, which is why it's minus log q of x. And then the overall expression has no minus sign. And then finally, in our discussion of how to evaluate a language model, we need to talk about perplexity. If negative log likelihood is a metric system, scientifically correct but perhaps a little unwieldy, then perplexity measurements are like American standard units. Fewer numbers to write, but not really well motivated. Unfortunately, just like learning how to tell temperature in Fahrenheit or buying a gallon of milk, you can't avoid it. Okay, so what is perplexity? Perplexity exponentiates the cross entropy between two distributions. But you almost always see it as a sample from a distribution, x1 to n, so I'm going to write it that way here. You have a sequence of tokens 1 to n, compute the cross entropy between that and your model m, and then raise 2 to that power. When you expand it out, the base between the exponent and the log half to match. And when it does, you can use a product property of the log to get a product of the probability of each of the things in the sequence that you saw raised to the negative 1 over n power, which you can simplify as a geometric mean of the reciprocal of each of the individual probabilities. So one question you might have is where did that super handy 1 over n come from? This is assuming that all of the words are equally probable, which I think is a fine assumption. The other thing in the notation that might throw you off is that we're just using m of x i for the probability of an observation under the model. Of course most models use the context somehow, so this should really be the probability of x i conditioned on whatever context it's actually using. So the thing about perplexity is that it is typically in fairly friendly units that are easy to talk about, something on the order of single digits or tens. That's why people use it over negative log likelihood or something like that. Okay, so how do you use this in practice? You use it to figure out how good a model is, but you need to split your data up to evaluate the model. First, you need to have training data to estimate your parameters. This creates a model. But there are lots of knobs you can tweak on this model, so perhaps you have a couple of different variants you need to try out. To evaluate those variants, you can use validation data or dev data to figure out which of those variants are good. And then you can choose which model becomes the chosen one by seeing how good it is on the dev data. We have our winner. After all of that, you now need to see how good that really is. You can't use the dev data anymore, it's used up to select this model. So to see how good this actually is, you need a new set of data. This is your test data. And then uh, you can see how good your model is at predicting stuff on this new data set. But now that you have used that test data, it is no longer test data. It ceases to be a test set. You've extracted some information from it, even if you just get the score of how good your language model is on that piece of data. You can't use it again, it then ceases to be a test set and is now a dev or validation set. And if you want to run another true test, you need to find or create new data. Just to reiterate, you can use dev data many times, you can only use the test data once. But don't overuse perplexity or negative log likelihood, whatever. When we talk about topic models, we'll discuss models that aren't any good at predicting words, and were never meant to predict words, but nevertheless were for decades evaluated with perplexity. Madness. 
Think about whether the evaluation actually matches what you want to do. Even a model can compute the probability of a word given a context. Doesn't mean that you should use perplexity as an evaluation. Do you actually care about the prediction? If yes, then go ahead and use perplexity. Otherwise, maybe think about measuring what you do care about. For example, on topic models, maybe you care about whether it makes sense to a human user. We're almost done, but before we wrap up, I have some things for you to know if you go out and want to compare two models' perplexities. Perplexity can be tricky, and not everybody computes it the same way. So let's talk about some of the ways it can go wrong. First, it's an empirical distribution. So the data set that you use to approximate English matters. Is this Newswire, social media, Wikipedia, what have you? In the best case, to compare models, you'd want exactly the same test set, newly created, only run once for each of the models. Even if you run on the same test set, you can get wildly different results depending on how you create the vocabulary. Is it words, bytes, characters, the 2,000 most frequent words from the training data set? All of these are defensible choices, but they lead to wildly different likelihoods or perplexities. And then what happens if you have something that isn't in the vocabulary? Do you ignore it? Do you replace it with an unknown word token? Again, these details matter and can lead to wildly different perplexities depending on how you pre-process your data. Other issues are what base to use for the exponent and your log. It should be 2, but some people use 10 or e or pi. Just check to be sure. I talked about how the test data is an empirical distribution, but how do you feed it into the model? Do you reset it after every sentence, every document? Do you treat it as one long sentence? Again, these choices are defensible depending on how you want to use the model later on, but you need to make sure that you do the same thing if you're comparing two different models. Relatedly, do models know when they're seeing a new document? If so, how is that communicated? Often we'll have a special start token to tell the model that, hey, this is a new context. But this, again, should be consistent across comparisons. Finally, some sentences are too long for a language model. What do you do with them? Throw them out? Truncate them? Give them the lowest possible score? These long sentences are infrequent, but they can make a big difference when you're comparing language models. So when you go out and try to use a language model, be safe and informed, and only use perplexity if you actually care about predicting the next generation. This is just one video from a course that I'm teaching. If you want to get the whole context, check out the course webpage linked below. There you can find all of the videos in the right order. YouTube likes to show you older videos out of order, homeworks, exercises, and recommended readings. And if you want to help other people find videos like this, please be sure to like and subscribe to provide a big gradient to the algorithm.